your name, Adonai. Praise be your name, precious Yahweh. God of all creation, God of our forefathers, God of our hopes. God, I thank you that we were able to wake up this morning and forgive us, Lord, of our sins, our iniquities and our transgressions, everything we've done that's been against you. Forgive us if our thinking isn't like you, if our hearts aren't like you. Forgive us, God, if we held on to anything we shouldn't have held on to. Forgive us, God, if we let go of anything we shouldn't let go to, have let go of. Forgive us, God. Would you interject your grace now in this moment? Interject your power and your anointing in this moment. Would you speak to us and surround us with peace, God? Quiet our storms. Quiet our minds. For God, we are looking forward not just to uh, a normal time of just breaking down, dissecting scripture, but we're looking to be instructed by you to hear from you. Father, we thank you. I lift my wife up to you, God, as she gets ready to teach God. Clear her mind. Give her peace. Give her strength. Give her the ability, God, to just go above and beyond that which she's ever, ever done before by way of ministry and sharing. Father, we pray right now, God, you would do a great and magnanimous work, Father. We trust you. We love you. We honor you today, God, and we look forward to you teaching through the vessel of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Trey. Amen. Amen. Good morning, intercessors. We're going to jump straight in, and we've been studying this week about the Lord who provides. Or well, the Lord will provide Yahweh Yaira. And we talked about yesterday how <clears throat> excuse me, the Hebrew word Ra, which Yaira is a derivative of, means to see. And in this case it's translated as provide. So since God sees the future as well as the past and the present. He is able to anticipate and provide for what is needed by each and every one of us. Now, I don't know about you, but that's extremely comforting to me because I'm grateful that we serve a God who sees and who knows. Amen. Now, what's interesting is the English word provision is made up of two Latin words that mean to see beforehand. We talked about this on yesterday. So, Yahweh Yaira, when we pray to him, we're praying to a God who sees the situation beforehand and is able to provide for our needs before we ever need them. It's amazing. He's already placed your provision along the path. All you have to do is keep going. So our focus scripture all week long is coming out of Genesis 22, verse 1 through 14. This morning, I'm going to just read verse 13 through 14 because we read the whole thing yesterday. Amen. So starting Genesis 22, verse 13 reads, Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called this that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. That was verse 13 and 14, amen. But I still want you to meditate on Genesis 22, verse 1 through 14. Allow the Holy Spirit to begin to reveal the hidden things. I want you all today to praise God for his loving provision in each and every one of our lives. I don't know where 
I know I don't know where I'd be personally without his loving provision. Amen. I don't think any of us do. But I want us to offer thanks today for the many ways that God has provided for our for spiritually. Have you taken the time lately to sit back and just meditate, think back to where you used to be, how you used to be, some of the things you used to do, some of the places you used to go, how your attitude used to be. Then I want us to get in our prayer closet this morning. I want us to confess any tendencies to live as though God's grace is cheap. It cost him his son. And he had to bleed every drop of blood out of his body. And so because of that, we were bought with a price. And we're not our own anymore. So I want us today to ask God to help us obey him without hesitation or compromise. My Lord. You know, a real man, a real boy, walked up the mountain together. The young man bent over, carrying a heavy wood for the burnt offering. The father, striding behind, carrying the fire and the knife. But where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Isaac asked. Can you imagine the story? God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham replied. You know, we've heard this story time and time again. We enjoy how it ends. But what if we didn't? What if Isaac had been your son, my son? The fulfillment of the promise that God had gave us. Could we have traveled for three days to Mount Moriah? the place of sacrifice, dreading every minute that passed and every inch that we came closer to it, yet walking steadily towards it. Could we have taken the knife in our hand, willing ourselves to obey the command we did not understand or that we had not wished to be heard We didn't want to hear it, didn't want to know. You know, it's hard to read this story without imagining how Abraham must have felt. Was his hand shaking as he held the knife? Was his mind reeling under the burden of the terrible command that he had been given that he had to obey? Is it not hard? Imagine the agony that he experienced looking at his son. But have you ever considered this whole story from God's point of view? You know, we always look at it from Isaac's point of view because he was a young man. So he could have overpowered his father, he could have been disobedient because. He went through the whole process of allowing his father to tie him up and lay him down on the altar. Have you ever thought about what God saw when he was watching Abraham and his son? Did God feel something tearing at his heart, knowing that what he asked was a great sacrifice. But he did not require of Abraham to complete the sacrifice. He wanted to know if he would make up in his heart to do it. He 
had to know that it was possible to be done because one day he would be required to do the same. As you read Genesis 22, verse 1 through 14, and reflect on the story of how Yahweh Yahira provided for Abraham and Isaac, try reading it from God's point of view. Try looking through the eyes of the Heavenly Father, who would one day make the costliest of all sacrifices, providing his only begotten son as the ransom for your soul, for my soul, for every soul that will accept him. As I meditate on that, I was just moved by what God is doing and how God is allowing certain things to unfold in my life, in the people's lives around me. And he took me over to Mark 5, verse 34. And it says, he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And that's the NIV version. But we know in King James it says, go and sin no more. You know, it's amazing how much I found so many people who love the story of this Venetian woman who was ill and sick, bent over, labeled and cast out by the community. And she had the issue of blood, as it was recorded in Mark 5 verse 21 through 34. She had spent 12 long years, all of her money, trying to get rid of the symptoms that caused her to be isolated from everyone else. There are so many lessons from from this particular story that are tucked inside. But let's look at one more. (laughs) The feeling of being rejected. You know, I can so relate to this woman. I mean, think about it. How many of us haven't felt the wretchedness of rejection, the shame of suffering, and the humiliation of hopelessness? can't help but wonder, would God care about the likes of me? I know what I was like before he came into my life. I know the things I've done. I remember oh too vividly those things that I encountered and I went through. And yet he still chose me. And here we have a story of just how much God values and esteems his his sons, his daughters. Those who are being rejected, pushed aside. He singled out one lone woman from a multitude of curious followers. He healed her of her affliction with but a touch, her faith touching the hem of his garment, and then shining the heavenly spotlight right on her. Because immediately he knew that there was a change. All of the all the followers and the fans who were touching him, they didn't have the faith that this woman had. But 
think about it. She was put center stage for her testimony to be displayed as a miraculous transformation right before the very eyes of the people who had rejected her. The woman that we meet in Mark chapter 5 has been called the woman with the issue of blood. We don't even know her name. We don't know about how old she may have been, but she was defined by what was wrong with her. For 12 long years, she wore that label. This woman had been suffering. And we can assume that it was a womanly issue. But when we meet her, she is physically, financially, socially, and spiritually drained. She's bankrupt in every single way possible. Right? So in Jesus' time, the biblical days, certain situations and conditions rendered a person ceremonially unclean. Leprous people were separated from society and had to shout unclean, unclean when they walked among common folks. So anyone who touched a dead body was considered unclean. And a woman, they were considered unclean during their monthly cycle. So for those days, Think about it. The time of a normal cycle for a woman. She was secluded for those days, isolated from everyone else. A woman hemorrhaging for 12 years would be considered permanently unclean. And if married, she would not be able to, she would not be able to marry. If she had been married, her condition would be grounded, would be grounds for divorce, and she would still have been isolated and rejected by the one who said he loved her. She would have been expelled from her home, cut off from her family, and ostracized by her community. So now when you think about that, Think about the doctors that she visited. Brought a surge of hope and expectation only to be swept away with the desperation of the issue remaining. The joy of tender youth was now a vague memory crushed by life's harshness and the weight of the disappointment. The hammer of rejection drove the nails of isolation straight into the coffin that tightly secured her heart. Can you imagine it? Are you picturing this? So unlike the lame man who was lowered through the roof by his four friends and placed at Jesus' feet, this woman had no one to intercede for her. There was no father pleading for his daughter. There was no husband praying for his wife. There was no master employing Jesus help to heal my a servant. So when we meet this woman, she was fearful and forgotten, ostracized and isolated. And isolated. She was alone, or so it seemed to her. Sometimes we can feel the same way, right? Abandoned by friends, deserted by a spouse, forgotten by family, unseen by society. But she was forgotten in her mind. But Jesus stopped by that little town to let her know that she wasn't. Just like he makes effort every single day to let us know that we're not forgotten. She was not alone. This daughter of Abraham was close to God's heart and foremost on his mind. So 
So God the Father orchestrated his son's journey to pass her way. He even allowed her to build up the courage, nudged her a little, told her to cover up. This woman understood that Jesus was radically different in his approach and appreciation of women. She knew full well that she was overstepping cultural and religious boundaries that were set out by pious men of her day. But it was a risk that she was willing to take. How many of us would take that risk? Knowing that death would be the ultimate punishment should she be recognized before she got close enough to touch him. See, there were two things that happened when she touched Jesus. First, she was healed. It was measurable. She felt the flow of blood cease completely. Jesus felt the power of God released. But secondly, she was revealed. Her courage was cloaked in anonymity, trembling in fear of exposure. But Jesus was not going to allow her to steal her healing. He wanted to do more than stop the flow of blood. He wanted to start the flow of ministry. He called her forward to testify, to tell what had just happened to her so that others could believe, would believe. He said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. No more. Mm. You know, a rabbi in that time didn't speak to a woman in public. But once again, I remind you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the liberator, he broke the man-made rules for the God-made woman, for the God-made son. for all of those who are willing to believe in him. He didn't call her out to embarrass or to shame her in any way. He called her center stage to honor her honesty, to commend her courage, and even to validate her valor. He did not reprimand her for breaking the religious rules, but praised her great faith. You see, once again, Jesus called a woman out from the shadows, called his daughters or his sons. He's been calling, just like he's calling you, out of the shadows. He needs you to step forward. Because now you're the testimony. You're the living, breathing, walking testimony of his goodness his mercy, his miraculous keeping power. And he's waiting to place you center stage. No longer will we be in need of a healing touch. But now a believer who had received it, we're called to tell everyone If you feel you don't have anything to preach, tell your story. If you feel you don't have anything to encourage someone, tell your story. When you feel like there's no connection and you're trying to find a common ground, be willing to be transparent and tell your story. You see, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to the woman after the healing. What do you ever think happened to her? What do you think she did with the rest of her life? How do you think the crowd responded to her healing? Mm. 
What does the Lord say to you about the things that he has done in your life? Because God is faithful. Amen? What does Revelation 12 and 11 tell us about the power of our personal testimony? Just listen. Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Are you an overcomer? Are you standing victorious with Christ and in Christ? You see, we don't have to worry about the things that the world is worried about because we have the Holy Spirit within us. Christ as our example to follow and guide us. And God watching over us. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes us the majority. That makes us victorious, more powerful, more relatable, more lovable, and contagious. When we operate the way that Jesus is leading us, let's not be fooled or swayed by our emotions, about what we think, but let us be rooted and grounded in the word of God, rooted and grounded in the teachings, being disciples of Christ, the discipline. that he will get the glory out of our lives. Every single day that we live, there's a story worth telling. Amen? Meditate on that for just a moment while I close us out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for joining us here today. Father, we are so grateful how you display your love boldly for us. Lord, we're so thankful that Jesus didn't let this woman slip away with her healing. That he didn't let any of his children, any of his beloved, take their healing and run and hide. But he called them out to tell what happened. He had them display the same mat that the young man was carried on and lowered into the ceiling on. is the same mat that the people saw him walk home with on his shoulder. Help us to speak up about the wonderful things that you've done for each and every one of us. And the wonderful things that you're doing in our lives. So that others may hear of your good works and believe. You are Yahweh Yaira, the God who provides for us, the God who loves us, the God who knows and sees all and makes provision for the situations that we're about to approach, the situations that are coming up in our lives. Help us to not only learn to love you, but to appreciate how you operate. And be willing to allow you to use us as vessels to carry your glory, vessels to reflect your light, vessels to love your people. We love you, Lord God, and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. With any questions, comments, thoughts, concerns, 
Did God bless any of you? Did he speak to your heart? Did he remind you of some things, expose some things? This is our time to share in assessors. 